I heard about a group of people who didn't think much of themselves, and they decided to get together as a support group and attract like-minded others, and maybe they could all sort it out. And so they put out a sign for the group that said, uh, low self-esteem support group, <laughs> meeting Thursday at 7 p.m., please use the back door. And today we're going to talk about how we use the front door instead. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, the power of power. It seems so redundant, doesn't it? <laughs> we're in the 12 Powers series, and this is the fifth power, and it's actually called power. But it's worth repeating because we so often misunderstand what power is. In our world, we are shown that and we're told that power is about status, power is about having a big office, power is about having a big paycheck or a beautiful car or a nice house or, you know, in a position to have power over and influence in that way. And yet there are some strands of, of this idea of influence for sure, um, but spiritual power is something completely different in, in many ways. Spiritual power is about owning that gift that was given us from the very beginning. Spiritual power is about that gift of what is called dominion that CL talked about, dominion being that spiritual authority. So why did, did we even get created? You know, why did the source create us if not to just know itself? If God was swimming in oneness and didn't know itself, how would God ever know itself unless it was created in all these different infinite forms? And so all this creation, all these infinite forms out of that divine intelligence that set into motion the evolution that is now today us, which is quite amazing if you think about it, and that each one of us has some form, some way of showing up and, and showing God what it is letting God relate to itself, to come to know what it is. And so it is through this gift of dominion, and the dominion often misunderstood that, first, that verse that CL shared, let us create humankind in our image and give them dominion over all life, did not mean dominate. <laughs> it meant be responsible for you know, have the ability to respond to and to care for all life forms. As David shared with me between services, the idea of stewardship, you know, that we are, we are donned stewards of this life. And that is one of the great gifts of what this spiritual power is all about. But oh, on the journey of power, don't we forget and misunderstand and so on, as we do with just about everything on the spiritual journey. So let's position power where it, where it is. It's located in the body, in the throat, particularly at the root of the tongue. And so it's connected very directly with the power of the word. And it's also signified by the color purple. The color purple is a, is a color traditionally of royalty, traditionally of spirituality. I don't know if you remember the book or the movie, The Color Purple, anybody? Yeah. See? yeah. Right, so I was curious, why was it called the color purple? And there's only one hint at the end of the movie, there's, or toward the end of the movie, there's a scene where Suge and Celia are walking through a field of purple wildflowers. And Suge says to Celia, you know, I think God gets pissed off when people don't notice the color purple. <laughs> and so maybe, really what she's saying is, People have been given this gift, this great gift of spiritual power, this dominion, this stewardship, this responsibility to be God in the world, to be the very embodiment of the divine. And really what she's saying is God gets pissed off when we don't do it, when we don't pay attention, when we don't notice, when we don't know who it is that we really are. And we forget and we create support groups so that we can, you know, <laughs> work on the, this esteem that we have forgotten. So power is such a slippery slope in so many ways because we don't want to, um, we, we get confused with ego a lot and then the ego can get kind of manipulative and we can give away our power. It starts pretty early, the confusion and then the remembrance of what power is. Because in the words of Don Miguel Ruiz, the author of The Four Agreements, 
we go through a process of domestication. You know, we come in these wild beings, these pure light, this full spirit. And then there's a process of learning to be human and follow the human rules and follow the family's rules. And, you know, you're very little and the parents around you are very big and the teachers around you are very big. And so there's this constant learning of, of lessons of power and many of them not really about spiritual power, right? So you can see the, the spirit and the power in a, in a child, and then you can see how that gets shaped and, and molded and sometimes you know, uh, depressed or recessed by the, the ways that we so-called domesticate. So what do we do? Well, we do our best to then free that, right? To set guidelines that help a child stay safe, but at the same time that it's not all about us and what we need. So I don't know about you, but um, you might remember a time when you, an early time in your life when you gave away your power. And you might actually think of it right now. Just give yourself a moment. To, and it, it, a memory may not come, but what could come is the feeling of what, what does it feel like when I give my power over, when I play small. Just get connected with the feeling, if not a memory. And then I invite you to let that recede and bring in the feeling or a memory of when I claimed my power, when I was fully in my spiritual power, when I spoke the truth and thought the truth and acted from it. And how does that feel? And so you might work with this this week. This is just a little touch in, but you might work with this week, this week to contemplate and maybe even come up with a memory, a first or an early time when I gave over my power or it felt like my power was taken away in some way, which means we agreed in some way to give it over. And that another time maybe when I reclaimed it and it will inform your early understandings of what power is so that it can inform your current intentions of how it shows up now. I remember when I was maybe, maybe about fourth grade, it was the first time that I really asserted my power with my mother. And I, it was like the, the line had been crossed. I had had it. I had been told too many times what to do and there would be no more. <laughs> and so I remember standing at the door and my mom's like, you're gonna miss your bus. And I'm like, and I started stomping my feet and I said, the mom's way, the mom's way. It's always gotta be the mom's way. Today, it's gonna be the kid's way. <laughs> my mom was just like. <laughs> <laughs> and it was this, you know, we both talked about this. It obviously had a formative effect on our relationship in both of us because we've many times revisited this memory. But it was, <laughs> it was so, so empowering because I, I mean, I just would not be swayed. She, she got so desperate, she started to try to call in the other authority figures. Well, I'm going to tell your dad. I'm going to call the principal. I'm going to tell your teacher. Not swayed. This was all over whether I was going to wear my school shoes or my tennis shoes on the field trip. You know, it's like, wasn't a big deal, as it never is, right? It's never really about the thing. It is about putting our stake in the ground and saying, this, I am an individual. <laughs> I have a connection to something where I have a freedom of choice and I have the freedom to speak that choice and to say what it is that I feel is true and right for me. And I was not going to be moved from that position of power. And it was such a, an amazing moment in time. And you might have something like that or some maybe not as strong of a memory, but you might have, because it, it's like super, like as I speak, I can feel it again. I'm in fourth grade again. I'm standing behind, standing at the back door. It's time to catch the bus and I am not going to be moved. You know, I can just remember that feeling. And what it felt like was truth. What it felt like was, was ownership of spiritual authority. And that's what it feels like when we claim the truth of who we are. It doesn't have to be a kind of combative situation like this happened to be for my mom and I in that moment, but it was also a turnaround, you know? It didn't mean that from then on I got to rule the house or anything. <laughs>
But it did mean that I knew now what it felt like to stand in my spiritual authority, to line up my thoughts and feelings with my words and my actions, which is what spiritual authority is about. It's about that kind of integrity, that kind of congruence. And we can feel how awful it feels when it's out, can't we? Can't you feel it when you say one thing and you do another and it's like, it just doesn't feel right? Or do you ever like not say anything and you know like there are people in the room suffering or that you have a different opinion but you're afraid it's going to be challenged or you're going to be excluded from the group or chided and so you remain silent and you can feel that dissonance inside of you that's like, mm, this doesn't feel right. And that is your spiritual power speaking, nudging your wisdom as well within you, nudging you to, to come into the alignment that you're here to, to be in. To be willing sometimes to be the voice that differs from the others in the room is, is honest and true. Not to just be different to, I mean, I'm not talking, that, that's just another ego game too. I'm not talking about trying to mix things up just to mix things up. I'm talking about when you feel a truth, know a truth, think a truth, and you speak it into being. It, it, it gives, it gifts to all of us the gift of spiritual power. It emulates the spiritual power and it gives it to others by being that example. So it takes some courage sometimes to be one who stands in their power, who speaks from their power, who moves with this sense of spiritual authority. But this is who we've come to be. There are many ways that as we kind of say colloquial now, we give away our power, right? We give it over. We don't, we don't own it ourselves. Linda Martella Witsit is an author of the book Divine Audacity, which is a fairly recent book on the 12 powers. We have it along with many others actually in the bookstore. I've been meaning to tell you, we have a display of multiple 12 powers books. Um, and while I'm on that topic, we also have for you a gift today, a little study guide large bookmark, if you will, um, of all the powers and the descriptions and the colors and so on. So the uh, ushers will be passing those out as you leave today. So you can follow along, you can dress in the color. <laughs> so, so now I just totally threw myself off there for a minute. Okay, oh yeah, Divine Audacity. So Linda Martella Witsit wrote this book and she talks about how she was an associate minister and her, the senior minister left, and she felt untrained and unready, but she kind of became the de facto spiritual leader. And so it was her first Sunday to speak, both services, and she was nervous. And that day there was also an iridologist coming to do a workshop after services. So she was standing by the coffee right before services started. And you know, a lot of times people wanna show what they can do. And so he came right up to her and, and he looked in her eyes and, you know, just without even asking, just, you know, gave her a reading. And he said, um, you are very insecure and nervous. <laughs> she said she had to, like, run to the office and just breathe a couple times before she went to come out to do the services, you know. And that it was kind of a, it, well, it wasn't disaster, but it wasn't, you know, wasn't what she really wanted to do. As, as an administrator friend of mine says, oh, I had one of those Sundays where I just wanted to pull a lever and, and fall underneath the stage. <laughs> I was wishing there was a little box I could just step in the right one. These are our little minister jokes that we have in my end. <laughs> we know those moments. It's like reset, reset. So anyway, so, 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 she, so she said afterwards, she was really thinking about what happened there. And it's like what happened there was somebody gave her some information and she believed it. And she took it in, and she, then she worried that everybody else would see what she was feeling on the inside, and that, you know, it would be terrible for everybody to see this. And so it just became, you know, what actually would have been powerful was for her to come out and say, hey, it's my first Sunday, and I'm feeling pretty nervous. I mean, that dispels a lot of that energy. Because it's, and why does that work? Because it's speaking the truth. It's speaking the, the, the relative truth of the moment is I'm having this feeling, it doesn't, it doesn't define her. This is a feeling that's coming through, you know? So when we speak in that way, in that honest way, and we know when, we've, when we speak this way or when we hear other people speak this way, how much we respect that, right? Don't you respect that when people are just really forthright and honest? And when you yourself, how good that feels? It's just clean. 
but it feels really clean and clear and current in the moment and current in that wave of spiritual energy that is power. That is what power really is. It's not really something that, that, is, um, that sits, you know. It's not, it's not like we have a storehouse of power necessarily. We have a, it's like electricity. It just flows through us and we ignite it, we activate it, and it flows through this process of thinking and feeling and speaking and acting. And that's the creative process. So whatever it is that we want to create in the world, if our thoughts and feelings line up with the words we speak, line up with the actions we take, we will be in that flow of spiritual power and truth. So it's the, where we notice those places of dissonance, those places of giving away our power, are the times when we want to, to move ourselves back into alignment, to think about what happened there. How did, it, how did I get off track? One of the things that Linda's husband told her later, Giles, is when you respect yourself, the people will respect you. You know, and that's always true, isn't it? When we love ourselves, when we respect ourselves, when we find the innate characteristics that are these powers and we activate them, then like attracts like and like reflects back to us. That's how the whole thing works, isn't it? So in our work then to, to engage these, this power, to understand this power, we don't want to do things like manipulate. So that's often what we'll do because we, v power is like vital energy, right? So we all need vital energy. And so if we're not experiencing it, if we're not feeling it, we'll do things to kind of go around. So people will do things like, um, well, spread gossip because that makes them feel powerful to know something and tell somebody else who might think, oh, they're in the know or to you know, create drama and to be in the center of some whirlwind of drama. That's also another way we'll try to kind of sidestep and, and get our power in this, in this way that's much more of a shred of the ego than it is true spiritual power. Or we might try to control others' behavior. So by controlling others' behavior, we, we think we might feel more powerful. But again, not really true spiritual power. So I have a, a friend, kind of a friend, somebody I feel like I know a little bit, and um, her story is, wow, 2,000-something uh, years old. And um, she lived in the Middle East, so just hold on a minute while I get her. <laughs> I am so weak. I feel so weak. I have been bleeding for 12 years. Not once a month, but 12 years. I can't believe I'm even standing here, actually. I have been to every doctor. I have been to every shaman in the land. I've traveled outside my village. I've taken all the potions. I've been under the spells of witch doctors. Nothing works. And if it weren't for the memory of the young woman that I was, who was tapped into passion and vitality and promise for my future, I might not be here at all today with one last hope. You see, I've heard that there's a healer in the land and that he's doing miraculous things, healing all kinds of people of all kinds of ailments. Do I have a hope? I don't know. But I've got nothing to lose, <laughs> quite literally. I've gone through all my money. And he's just over there. It looks like there's a million people swarming around him. And if I go in that crowd, I might get trampled. But what have I got to lose? <laughs> and what do I have to gain? I think, if, if memory serves, I have much to gain. And so I'm going in. And even if he doesn't 
address me or heal me in some way, because now I can hear the crowds and I hear them calling to him. This man is saying his 12-year-old daughter is ill, and now this man, Jesus, he's starting to, to move toward and follow this man, and so now I'm going to have to move more quickly, and I don't really have the energy or the breath, but I have the will. And so I think if I can just make it in there, and if I can just touch him, maybe, just maybe, I'll feel something. I don't know. It's, it's what I feel guided to do. And so in I go, and I'm getting squished and jockeyed everywhere, but I'm remaining on my feet, thank God. And there he's closer, and almost I could possibly get under those feet and around those, and possibly I could touch him. And now I I think I'm healed. I feel so different. I'm trembling, but the trembling is from not, not the weakness, not the fear, but the power. I feel that vitality again. I feel whole again. I feel like that young woman who had possibility. I can't believe this. I can't believe this. I am not losing life force. I am bringing forth the life force, the divine spirit, the truth, the, ma the amazing possibilities that are here now that I have my health, I think. Will it last? I don't know. Uh-oh, now I hear him looking for me. <laughs> <laughs> Who touched me? Who touched me? I felt the power go out. Who touched me? And his disciples, those people, the followers, are all around him, and they're saying, anybody could have touched you. Everybody touched you. The crowd is thick. Everybody's moving in on you. No, somebody touched me in a way that the power left me. Who was it? Who touched me? Oh, no. <laughs> I think I'm going to have to come clean. <laughs> Sir, it was I who touched you. Take heart, daughter. His words were like honey. His words were a soothing balm through my whole being. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. Suffer no more and go in peace. And that was the day I understood that spiritual power speaks with love. Spiritual power is inside of me. And for all of us, we might realize that it's not so much the reaching out to touch the outer healer, but the reaching in to ignite the Christ. That's where the healing happens. It's in here. It's in here. And so our friend shows us the way. <laughs> shows us the way that there is always this longing, this desire that we have in our hearts to express more, to reveal more, to be more of the spirit that we came to be so that God could know itself. That is a, a constant desire that's below the surface, and it, and it comes out in many different ways. But if we can tap it, and this woman, so weak, so, I mean, that's, that story is in all three synoptic gospels, which usually indicates it's a true story, because all these different witnesses tell that story again and again and tell it pretty similarly. And so it's a powerful story in that we can at some point get off course and the life force energy just begins to leak out everywhere. <laughs> and we begin to give it away because it just, that's the way we learn is how the power works. And so we just give it away or we manipulate or we try to move around. But the truth is that all we have to do is reach not out but in to the, tr to the truth 
to the Christ, to the divine that we are, and ignite that truth. Charles Fillmore and all the New Thought teachers teach us that the how-to is through the power of the word, which is why the power is located in the throat. It's through the power of the word that we realign ourselves with the truth of who we are. It's through the power of the word that we awaken the I am, the Christ of our being, and we remind the rest of us who we are so that thoughts, words, feelings, and actions are all lined up. And so things like I am healed and whole, I am, I am vital, I am, my energy is completely restored. When we say these things from a place of faith, and even if we're not all the way there, from a place of hope, from an idea that maybe if I just reach in a certain way, maybe there's a chance that everything will open up for me and I can be fully healed. I can be financially free. I want to claim that right now for our community, yes? That we are financially free so that we can do what we've come here to do. That we are, we know that there's one source. And there are so many channels, many channels we have not yet even begun to imagine. So open the floodgates, God, and bring in the good, you know? Open all the channels that are possible to bring in the good. And we welcome it. We stand in a place of faith and deservedness and knowing that the good that is done with that will be multiplied and blessed many, many, many times over beyond our imagination. I see this place packed and overflowing, don't you? I see the lawn packed and the community room packed, and not just on Sunday mornings, but all the time, because we have so much to offer here that the world is hungry for, and they're looking for power in all the wrong places. It's here, it's here, it's here, it's in us, and we are the ones who become it, who allow ourselves to be the truth of who we've come here to be, and then it's like a magnetizing force. No one can stay away because they want to transform themselves and transform the world. We want to heal our bodies and our minds. We want to heal our world and be restored to the wholeness and the truth of who we've come to be. Do we not? We want to live lives that are alive and passionate. We want to prosper, not just financially. That's just a tool, but it's an energy and it's an important tool that allows us to do what is ours to do, that allows us to be who we came to be. You know, every one of us has a unique stamp, a unique way of being in the world, something unique to bring to the world. And if we don't, if we don't align ourselves in our spiritual power, a void is left in the universe. If we don't reclaim that power at some point, if we don't align it up and show up in that way, there's just this empty void. I mean, if that's okay with you, okay, but it's not okay with me. <laughs> and I don't think it's okay with you, or you wouldn't be on the path because it matters to us to know why we're here, not specifically necessarily, but to know at least of who we are, these 12 powers ignited, the Christ itself. It's no longer a reaching out to a teacher who showed us the way, because that teacher continuously told us that it's inside, that it's within you, that, it, that you are the hope of glory. The Christ in you is the hope of glory. The things that I do, you will do, and greater things will you do. And still we want to give our power away to someone else. Still we want to look for a Messiah. Still we want, you know, still we tend to, to reach outside and to look outside. And again and again and again we learn on this journey that's not where it happens, is it? It's here. It's inside. It's available to us. Florence Scovel Shin said, your word is your wand. And so it is through the power of the word located here that we bring forth the power that we are meant to be and meant to see and meant to have. It is through the claiming that we allow ourselves to be in complete coherence with who we've come to be. So let's act and speak and be in that spiritual mastery. Let's, as, as Charles Fillmore said, speak to the multitudinous thought people of our body and soul and line them up to the truth, 
to the I am, to the truth of who we are. And all it takes is maybe a few breaths of the presence to recognize that we are, it's here for us, it's available to us, it's within us. And then to, to know that for a moment and tend to speak that truth and then to walk that direction. And then, of course, there'll be times we forget that we fall away, that we start to do the old ways of going around and believing in worldly power. But then what do we do? We just recenter ourselves once again, remember once again who we are, recall that memory, that time that we were stomping our feet and reclaiming our power, or whatever it was for you that allowed you to remember who you are. And to feel that again, to feel that vitality again, like the woman who was healed in that instant. So let's know this together. Let's speak this together. Let's be this power together. We can do amazing things in this community and in our lives when we align with the truth of who we are. Let's say this together. My word is my wand. I speak and act with spiritual authority. So it is.